chances are good that you've been here before. You see a hazard tree, one or more. This hazard represents a potential threat to your line, your crews, and other crew safety. What do you do now? Step back and take a tactical pause. Know that the decision you are about to make, how you choose to mitigate this risk, is extremely important. In recent fire seasons, more than once, even though a hazard tree has been identified, it has still injured firefighters. And as we all know, hazard trees have already taken the lives of way too many wildland firefighters. So why do we keep getting hit by them? How can you improve your own hazard assessment and decision process for mitigating or avoiding this risk? Let's take a look at a couple of recent hazard tree incidents. Then we'll talk about what you can do to be better prepared for your next encounter with that inevitable hazard tree. First, here's the story of what happened to a firefighter on the 2010 Meadow Creek Fire, as told in the Meadow Creek Fire Accident Prevention Analysis Report. You are filling in as a Wildland Fire Modules Assistant Leader. You have 17 years of Wildland Fire experience. Your crew members say that they highly respect you as a strong firefighter and leader. While your module installs a remote automated weather station, you and one of your crew members volunteer to hike up a steep and rugged drainage to scout the bottom of your fire. It is a demanding two-hour scramble through difficult terrain that requires frequent wading in the creek, sometimes through waist-deep water. Your goal is to reach a large log jam located at the bottom of the fire that has been identified by an aerial recon. When you reach the log jam, you are directed over the radio to start a burnout operation, lighting 150 to 200 feet of line from the cold black to the creek. Due to a recent rain, this burnout is not very successful. At 1400 hours after your attempted burnout, you survey the area near the log jam. Just uphill from you, inside the black, you identify several hazard trees. One of these trees, a green 12-inch diameter fir, located approximately 75 feet away from you, has a predominant side hill lean. A log is burning at the base of this tree. At this time, no significant winds are blowing in the canyon. Even so, you are still concerned about these burning hazard trees just upslope from you. You as the leader of this mission and your crew member both agree. We should leave soon. Because this tree that you have identified as presenting the most risk to you has a side hill lean, you believe it will not fall directly onto your current location. This log jam serves as a common reference point for the heel of your fire. Therefore, before you leave the area, you decide that you need to get its coordinates. With your handheld GPS unit, you climb five feet up onto the log jam. You are looking down at your GPS unit when you suddenly hear the hazard tree. You look up to see that big fir tree fall 90 degrees off its lean. It's heading directly at you. You jump, but midair in your leap, that tree hits you. The impact knocks you sideways and spins you around. You fall five feet to the ground, crashing hard onto your body's right side into large river rocks. When you look up to see where the tree landed, your first thought is that because you jumped out of the way, you avoided a serious injury or death. Your crew member, a former EMT, runs to you. He begins an injury assessment. Your only visible wound is a scratched bloody ear. For your safety, you both know that you need to get out of here. You move to a nearby sandbar. You both marvel at how the tree came down much sooner than you thought and not in the direction that you had expected. You know that you've been banged up and bruised, but you don't think you've been hurt that badly. Even though you're limping, you are adamant that you can hike out without calling for help. It takes you four hours, twice as long as the hike in, to make this journey out. During the hike out, you discuss whether, if the accident had been more serious, a helicopter could have been brought in for a medevac. You decide that a helicopter, even with a long line and basket, would have been too great of a risk in this narrow drainage. The best anyone could do would be to walk or pack someone out. 
you eventually go to the hospital where you discover that your injury caused a pelvic fracture, a hip fracture, and three broken ribs. For the next six weeks, you will be on crutches. What have you learned? Next time you see a hazard tree, will you do anything differently? Now, here's the story of what happened to a firefighter on the 2011 Snowgate Fire Incident 554, as told in the Snowgate Fire Incident 554 Facilitated Learning Analysis Report. You are a member of an initial attack saw team on this one and a half acre fire. Snags have been thoroughly communicated to you as your biggest hazard on this fire. After running the saw for approximately one hour, you and your saw partner switch roles. You are now the swamper. In the area where you are now working, both you and your partner recognize that the heavy fuel loading and numerous snags are a key safety concern. As you proceed, you and your partner see and make each other aware of a burning hazard snag. It is located just inside the fire line from you, approximately 12 feet off your line. This burning snag is 40 feet tall with a 12 to 14 inch diameter at breast height. You notice that the tree's top half already has two fire weakened areas. Your saw partner bucks one down log, then starts to buck another. You look away from the hazard snag to throw the buck section of log away from the fire into the green. The lookout located uphill from you notices you moving this chunk of log. The lookout then sees the top half of that burning snag break off and fall. He yells. But it's too late. This 20-foot section of burning snag falls on you, hitting your right shoulder and knocking you to the ground. Everyone realizes that a serious accident has just occurred. They rush to your aid. There are three EMTs on your incident, who all immediately converge on your accident scene to help you. An IC is established for this emergency incident within an incident. Within one hour, you are on board a ground ambulance heading for the nearby hospital, where you will be diagnosed with and treated for a broken scapula, two broken ribs, two fractured vertebrae, and a sprained ankle. What have you learned? Next time you see a hazard tree, will you do anything differently? So what's your take home message here? Reducing risks from hazard trees involves actions at multiple levels. What we're focusing on here is the individual firefighter awareness component. Those situations in which you suddenly find yourself confronted with one or more hazard trees. Here's some helpful guidelines to consider. Utilize the Hazard Tree Safety Awareness Tool located in the gold section of your Incident Response Pocket Guide. Is your proposed operation located in a high-risk zone? How many firefighters will be exposed? How long will this exposure last? Modify your tactics to avoid high-risk areas. Take the time to size up potential hazard trees from a safe distance. Continue to reevaluate your hazard tree's condition and status. Be alert to changing conditions, including wind, rain, the burning through of roots or stems, and retardant drops. And remember, Killer trees are not always snags. Killer trees can appear green and healthy. Learn the indicators for structural defects in trees. Don't work under trees with dead tops, cat faces, severe lean, or other signs of weakness. Assess the small diameter trees. Avoid the temptation to only scan for large or obvious hazard trees. Be aware of the possible domino effect, how a seemingly distant hazard tree can fall into another one closer to you and drive that tree into your location. This scenario has injured many wildland firefighters. If you have a close encounter with a snag or hazard tree, notify your supervisor and your crew. 
In summary, when confronted with a potential hazard tree, remember these three fundamental actions. Identify, communicate, and mitigate. Identify the hazard. Does this tree have the potential to harm you or others? Communicate the hazard. Ensure that this hazard is made known to your supervisor and other fire personnel. Mitigate the hazard by avoiding or eliminating it. To avoid it, close the area with flagging. Reroute your fire line and continue to safely meet your operational objectives. To eliminate it, if qualified fallers or blasters are available and it can be done safely, drop the tree. Make sure that you consider and measure all of the risks and benefits of engaging in any falling operation. SAW teams also need to know when it's best just to walk away, realizing that this is always an option. Firefighter safety always comes before accomplishing the mission. With any hazard tree, you need to ask yourself, what's the worst thing that will happen if we just leave the tree alone? Bottom line, you should always be prepared to answer and act on this seemingly simple yet powerful and complex question. You see a hazard tree. Now, what do you do?